I want to first of all thank you from the bottom of my heart for this very affecting, deeply moving reception. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not good at this. I'm not good at being tied to a microphone. So if you find me wandering around among you, uh, uh, you're just going to have to get used to it. Uh, <clears throat> it is, isn't this such a momentous occasion when all of God's children, the short one and the tall one like me, <laughs> the peeled ones, and if you're wondering who the peeled ones are, I'm Yoruba from western part of Nigeria. You heard of some people who uh, call pale face? <laughs> well, the Yorubas call white people the peeled ones. <laughs> and I think it's quite pic picturesque, isn't it? <laughs> you know, that, that we, you know, they somehow had the, the darker complexion peeled off and uh, no malice, no malice whatsoever. <laughs> but, so the good Lord in his wisdom created all of us. And if you remember the story of creation in the book of Genesis, do you remember that? God didn't speak of a black person. A yellow person. A red person. He created Adam and Eve, and we, all of us, his offspring, should be celebrating life together as brothers and sisters. Amen. There's a lot, um, because of the anxiety, <laughs> brought on by the monstrous traffic from Atlanta to here. Uh, I, you know, the, the program was supposed to have started at 6.30, but I kept looking at my watch and the, the creepy crawly traffic in front of me. I, I was hoping that, that there would be some magical button in the car that I was driving that would sort of, you know, help me to leap over the traffic. And, uh, but I said that to say that, that um, I, I actually had a Bible with me. And I wanted to share that Bible with you because that Bible too is 50 years old. It was a, my, a gift given to me by Donald Baxter's parents. And as John said, Don Baxter was a brave soul that had the courage to agree to be my roommate my first year at Mercer. Before I go any further, though, I want us to join me in saluting my brother and my friend. Uh, I gathered that John is going to be retiring uh, at the age of, ripe old age of 37. <laughs> <laughs> so if you'll kindly join me for the meritorious services provided uh, this university and the students and also the vision that the good Lord blessed him with to start this amazing uh, symposium. So please join me in saluting John. another uh, important business matter to address. Fifty years from now, there's probably going to be another uh, symposium, a different kind, because by that time, by the God's good grace, all of God's children would have come to accept the fact that they are indeed what? All of God's children. But since John is retiring, 
Uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you that I may not be able to accept your invitation to speak on that occasion. <laughs> I got a phone call not too long ago. I thought it was um, one of those prank calls, or telemarketers. And the person on the phone said, are you Sam Oni? I said, yes. He said, well, uh, I'm going to invite you on an immense journey. And I said, when? And he said, well, that's for me to know <laughs> and for you to find out. And then he said, I want you to know that I don't take no for answers. So I may actually not be around. I may be on that immense journey <laughs> 50 years from now. So I am, uh, I am going to recommend to the, to the symposium a uh, candidate to stand in this, at this podium or whatever else it's held. And that will be uh, Professor Noah Silver. All right? And as a backup to, to that speaker, we'll also have Dr. Johnny Donaway. <laughs> okay. Those two I recommend 50 years from now to be the speakers <laughs> at this event. <clears throat> I don't want you to take me too seriously because life is too serious, somebody said, to be taken too seriously. I really want to engage you in a dialogue rather than me coming to lecture you. I also want to quickly offer an apologia, not an apology. Mayor um, Jack Ellis and I came to know one another when I had, did a stint with the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And in the course of our, several of our conversations, he told me that his father had worked for Mercer University. I was kind of struck by that. Because I said to myself, well, you know, if this man's father had worked for Mercer University, then as a matter of course, he or some of his older siblings would have what? Would have become students. <laughs> and as John said, even though officially I was the first to break the color bar, as it were, Benny Stevens and Cecil Dewberry be began classes with me in 1963, the fall of 1963. The truth of the matter is, and uh, Benny Stevens, as some of you may also know, was the valedictorian of his, sec of his uh, high school. Uh, was it ballot? No, Appling, right? Appling and, um, and um, Ballot Hudson. Those were the two black uh, uh, high schools in, 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 uh, in Macon. And there had been many, as you, needless to say, many other valedictorians, bright, able, that could have uh, be, uh, continued the, the university education at Mercer University. But this monstrosity that we've created, this fiction of each one of our imaginations that we call race, did not allow that to happen. And I came because I felt called by the Almighty to carry out this mission. I've shared this story with, uh, on several in different uh, venues. When word came to me in Sekondita Kuradi where I was, uh, by the way, there's always confusion as to is he Nigerian, is he Ghanaian? Simply put, my parents were Nigerian, living in Ghana, and I was born in the Gold Coast. Are you more confused now? <laughs> The Gold Coast was a British colony, became independent in 1957, and upon attaining independence, changed its name to Ghana. All right? So 
I was a young man in, in the Gold Coast, and the village where we lived was kind of quaint. We were not directly in the deep jungle. We were on the verge of the jungle. And we're also blessed to have a rail, railway, railway we call it, ra railroad track. Very close. And one of the exciting things that we used to enjoy as children was standing there because it was being, and waving to those passengers. We used to be so captivated by the, the train. And thus, I became, it, it, it became an obsession, love affair with, with, with trains. The other thing that also, as a child, fascinated me was school. Does anybody here remember the first day of school? The very first day? OK. About two years ago, that memory came flooding back for me. And that was when John Dunaway's granddaughter began school, and uh, Michael Dunaway, we were almost like a family, and uh, on Facebook had a picture of uh, Clary plastered all over. With The uh, backpack was probably twice her, her own size. <laughs> and the memory came flooding back of my first day of school. I woke up that Monday morning, I looked around, for all my pl uh, playmates, and there was nobody, they were nowhere to be found. So I said to Mama, where is Kweku? And where is Kwame? And where is Kofi? And Mama nonchal nonchalantly said, oh, they've gone to school. School? What's that? And Mama said, that's where you go to learn, to read books, to learn how to read books. So I said, then I'm there on the spot. Well, I would like to go to school too. <laughs> and so my mother said, okay, you'll have to wait till tomorrow. And um, true to her word, the very next day, she marches him off to the school, not too far from, from where we lived, and um, introduces me to the school teacher. And the school teacher said, Sam, come here. So I walked up, a bit some trembling and trepidation, but I walked up to him. And he said, well, how old are you? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, turned to my mother and said, well, how old is he? My mother said, so the teacher called, called me to come closer to him. And I walked to him and he said, I want you to do something for me. He said, I want you to touch your right ear with your right hand over your head. So I tried and I reached and I reached and I reached and I stretched and I finally touched my left ear. And the teacher just looked at me and said, boy, you're old enough to start school. <laughs> Now, that may be unscientific to your scientific <laughs> mind. <laughs> so that's how I started school. And I loved it. I loved school. But in addition to going to school, it was a kind of a give and take, quid pro quo. If you're, the schools were established by the missionaries, and these were English missionaries, uh, the Anglican missionaries. So if you had the privilege of attending their schools, then you ha also have to do what? Attend their church. So I began, and we'll go to church regularly, enjoy that too, Sunday school, and those fascinating stories. I mean, that thing used to fire my imagination about this God sitting up there on a, tr on a throne. Uh, I mean, I, but it was, it, was, it was a fascination. But later on, as I got a bit older, two uh, things I began, find, began to find uh, Sunday school and, and church a bit boring. And I wasn't alone. So Sunday, come Sunday, my friends and I will leave home. We're going to church. We'll tell our parents. <laughs> but instead, 
will go on some kind of adventure or another. The adventure was fun, but the consequences for taking those adventures were rather severe. <laughs> because our church will be one of the teachers who will take Role of roll calls of all the, the pupils, the children that attend the church. And on Monday morning, he'll have a list of all those of us absentees. And he will call each one of us to line up in front of the class. And then he will invite four other students to come to the front of the class. And what they will do is uh, they will have one child will hold one arm, another child will hold the, another uh, one arm, and the limbs. And you'll be sus suspended in midair while the teacher will pull out his lash. <laughs> and uh, if you're lucky, you might get, depending on how many church services you've missed, you might get 10 lashes, you might get 12, you might get 15. And I used to pray that I will be the first to be called because I was so chicken, so, 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 so scared. But that was the kind of price I paid for my f Christian faith as an innocent child. And that was the beginning of my coming so consumed by the faith. In spite of the, <laughs> the fact that I, I was paying double for it. Can you Christ pay the price first, right? <laughs> and I'm also being made to pay a second time. <clears throat> but I became fascinated with it. At the same time that I was dealing with the faith that has been brought by foreigners, I was also dealing with another foreign influence. My father, I hardly knew. I didn't know my father because he was gone all the time. He was gone all the time because he worked in the home of white British uh, civil servants. He was their cook. He was their washerman. He was their uh, floor polisher. He was their uh, shoe polisher. And uh, perhaps once a month, he'll come home and we'll see him. And we'll be so happy to see him. It's a long story, but I'll, uh, I'll try to uh, call, 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 cut it short. Um, somewhere along the way, I followed in my father's footsteps. And I became a house servant for some of these British colonial civil servants. I was their cook, their floor mopper, the dishwasher, the washerman. And it was that, during that period of time that I came to know the first Southern Baptist missionary. His name was Reverend McGinnis. Because when the Reverend McGinnis arrived in Ghana, Ghana was just about to become an independent nation, free from British control. So many of the British civil servants, colonial civil servants, were returning to Britain because they weren't going to be serving under a black uh, government. And um, the missionaries, the, well, the first one that I met, Reverend McGuinness, moved into one of the homes vacated by the British civil servant. Mr. and Mrs. McGuinness had a son named David, about my age. And uh, I used to feel sorry for him because while I had all the African friends when I, when I returned to the village, uh, David had no, no, nobody to play with. 
So whenever uh, I'll take my lunch break, I'll walk over to their house, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll um, Mrs. McGinnis will be looking out the window, and I'll say, I'll, uh, I'd like to see David. And he'll tell me to wait and, and summon David to come and see me. I was never invited into the home. It probably didn't mean much to me then. It was through uh, Reverend McGinnis that I began to know about the Southern Baptists and their own brand of the Christian faith. As I said, being a Christian is something that I have been practically all my life. Nominal, if you will, but I've been a Christian all my life. Before long, the McGinnises, if there is such, such, such a word, began to invite me to go to worship with them. Well, what they actually needed was an interpreter, right? They needed an interpreter, and they found it, I uh, might as well kill one bird with one stone, <laughs> invite him to worship, invite him to worship, but at the same time, use him as your interpreter. I didn't mind it at all. And it was during the course of working with them that the, uh, Reverend McGinnis, his wife, began to impress upon me the need to be born again. The need to be rebaptized by what? Immersion. Immersion. The emphasis on the fact that the little dab dab that the Anglicans did wasn't going to get me into heaven. <laughs> So of course, who, who was I to argue with them? So I went along, and I became, uh, you know, sort of became part of the Southern Baptist uh, um, brand of the Christian faith. One thing led to another, uh, and also I came to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and therefore born again. And before long, Dr. Mc, uh, Reverend McGinnis began to talk to me about the fact that you are saved to do what? To serve. The next thing I knew, I was enrolled in a Bible school. It was a, it was a, a mini theological school and uh, that, that the Southern Baptists had just uh, established in Ghana. I made a str strong enough an impression on them that they asked me to, they, they, they sort of funded my going, getting my secondary school education as well, a scholarship. To call it a scholarship is really to really um, <laughs> dignify, because it, re it wasn't that much money. Well, perhaps in, in, the, in the context of the time, it was. So I was given this scholarship to, earn, to be one of the pioneer students at Sadler Baptist Secondary School. And um, things were going very, very well. I was doing well in school. And then the student body decided to go on strike. The reason for the strike was that the Americans didn't quite grasp the uh, British form of education. Because in the British system that we were uh, uh, operating, you didn't just graduate from high school based on your years of uh, GPA and all, you know, accumulated. There is a final exam that you have to take. And, if you, and you, your future may actually depend on how you did on that exam. It was called the West African School Certificate Exam. And the American missionaries had no clue as to how to prepare us for these exams. And we kept pressing them. Uh, <clears throat> Melinda seems bored, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we kept pressing them to employ some uh, uh, Ghanaian uh, teachers that might be able to help us out. They refused. And so the student body decided to go on strike. And they came to me knowing how favored I was with the missionaries, whether I was going to join them. And I thought about it, and I said to myself, there was no way I could sit by and watch my fellow students fight this just cause and me not be a part of it. 
And essentially, that's how I became leader of this demonstration. And uh, it didn't go well, with, it sit well with the missionaries at all. One of the missionary wives looked me in the eye and said, Sam, you are an ingrate that has bitten the fingers that fed him. I was kicked out of that school with seven other so-called, um, what is it, uh, ringleaders. And I thought that was the end of, um, of, 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 of my educational uh, opportunity. Again, to cut the so long story short, uh, Harris Mobley, whom John referred to earlier, had recently arrived, and prior to settling down at, at his own station, he, he, well, it, was the, it was the practice then, he had toured all the other missionary st stations, and, and wherever, he'd, wherever he'd gone, they've had something, he'd heard something good being said about me, particularly with regard to my, how strong I was in the faith. So again, as the good law will have it, Harris Mobley was stationed in my hometown. So when I saw this, this setback, I said to myself, I'm gonna go see this man and uh, tell him what had happened. Well, Harris and um, Vivian, his wife, they couldn't believe it because it was, it was so contrary to everything that uh, all these other missionaries had told them about me. And they then offered to find, if I could find another secondary school, offered to pay my way uh, through secondary school. That's how Harris and I became friends. And again, leaping ahead, don't want to take too much of your time. I'd become, I become very fascinated with, with the matter of colonialism, um, Christianity in my part of the world. My father. Uh, being a house servant to people who were about the age of his first, first born, it was almost an ab abomination because ours was what the uh, social scientists call inscriptive society, as opposed to uh, you know, society based on, on merit. You know, if you, have a, if you have a doctorate degree, then people look up to you. It doesn't matter whether you're 37, like John, or, or, or a bit older, all right? Uh, and then the other thing was, it was also a male-dominated society. And things like doing household chores was considered almost um, a taboo for a man. And those are part of the things that began mauling in my own mind. And then along came this man named Kwame Nkrumah, he became the firebrand that led Ghana to its independence. He was one that be then began to address the matter of how this handful of white people had come from another part of the world to come and dominate us. One of the things that I forgot to mention to you was that my father working as a house, as a domestic, was working with not just co uh, British colonial civil servants, but he was working for uh, uh, colonial, uh, colonial uh, engineers mi who were mining engineers because uh, m much of the work they were doing was mining bauxite. And anybody knows about bauxite? Uh, that's where uh, aluminum, that's, that's what. Uh, so they were mining bauxite and shipping it from Ghana to where? England or the United States or whatever the market was. And that was one nasty aspect of colonialism. Uh, part, part of the fact that it was exploitative, demeaning, it was also uh, cruel in many, many respects. So as a young man, I began wondering about all this. Ghana then became independent, and about the same time that Ghana became independent in 57, <coughs> I began reading about the civil rights movement in the United States of America. And I began seeing images of uh, Mr. Bull, Bull Connor. Yeah. It was that, I mean, that shock of recognition uh, just left me paralyzed. 
And as you can well imagine, I happened to have certain missionaries around me that I could help me out, help me understand. Because here you are among us, living with us as brothers, and although you live separate from us. Remember what I said about uh, the Mechanisms living in taking, occupying the homes left by the British colonial civil servant. Most of the missionaries that I addressed these questions to were too embarrassed to address, uh, answer them, except for Harris Mobley, who said, Sam, essentially, I'm not quoting him verbatim, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> because he said to me, if I'm from Georgia, he said, I'm from Savannah, and if I were to go to America with you, Sam, and come Sunday, invite you to go to my church in Savannah, you and I, you are, you'll be turned away and I, as a punishment, that is Harris Mobley, as a punishment, will be turned away with you. I, 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 couldn't, believe, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. So one thing led to another, this, this incongruity, you know, this contradiction of, of what the missionaries were preaching overseas. The, the discussion with Harris Public was ongoing, and believe you me, uh, I didn't even know that when he came home on, 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 uh, um, on furlough or, or leave, that he and Professor um, Rufus Harris had actually discussed the prospect of integrating Mercer University. And again, unbeknownst to me, Harris Mobley had uh, submitted my name to uh, Dr. Harris. And when he told me about it, I felt, yeah, I felt very positive about it. It was something that had to be done. And I tell you this story because, um, and it's only natural. I mentioned um, former mayor um, Jack Ellis, Benny Stevens, and many others before them that could have come to Mercer as a matter of course. But this monster of segregation got in the way built a wall. So that's how my name was submitted to Dr. Harris, um, Mercer University. I had graduated top of my class. I was very athletic. I was kind of an all-rounder. Um, the kind that the kind that I've seen you know, some university will have said, yeah, you know, without any hesitation at all. So Mercer University kept me waiting, and I didn't know what was going on. I was aware, of course, I mean, that's what led to, uh, to the, idea, the idea of the um, Harris Mobley submitting my name. I was aware of r racial discrimination and all that. But um, finally, I think it was about almost a year. I was kept waiting almost a year, and finally they said I could come. And in the meantime, I had also been reading, I'll go to the USIS, which is the, uh, the uh, US, the, um, the American Embassy Information Services Center, and read as much as, as I could. I accepted the, uh, so finally, after waiting for almost a year, the uh, acceptance letter came, and I arrived on the Mercer campus, and uh, Bernie Stevens, Stevens came, although he lived off campus. Cecil Dewberry, who, by the way, was uh, the first black to graduate from Mercer because he transferred from Fort Valley State. They came, took their class, and again, having been born in America, they knew the unwritten rules that govern black-white relations. Me? But it wasn't anything that happened on campus that was challenging to me. It wasn't. 
And I don't know whether it was the fact that the administration had said to every, <laughs> written to every student, look, if you're coming to Mercer, we're going to have a black face on the campus, and we don't want any thing on toward, towards him. I don't know whether that actually was, uh, was done. But no, nothing happened. Um, some minor incidents that I would go into. John alluded to the fact that Don Baxter and I uh, decided that we'll go to worship at Vineville Baptist Church. Well, every Baptist church contributes towards the missionary um, enterprise, you know, donation, uh, <laughs> uh, or they even find a missionary among themselves that they will send to. And another irony that I want to <laughs> bring to, to your attention is the fact that the Southern Baptist missionaries went to, of all the places they could have gone to in Africa, they went directly to the slave coast. The West African coast, you, you know that. Ghana, Senegal, um, Gambia, uh, Nigeria. Those were the places where the slaves were captured and brought to. It's also significant to remember that in 1845, and we have an expert in the house, uh, if, if I'm wrong, wasn't that where the breach came from the... 1845. 1845. On, the, on what issue? Whether a slave owner could be appointed a missionary. Mm -hmm. So they broke with the American Baptists um, Convention, I guess, and then the Southern Baptists but guess what? Five years later, after that break, the Reverend um, Thomas Owen, uh, yeah, Bowen, arrived among my people in Nigeria, the first Southern Baptist missionary. Five years after they broke with the Baptist body on the issue of slavery, they sent the white missionary to my people in, in, on, along the slave coast of West Africa to, to, to uh, you know, uh, preach, preach the gospel to us. Now, the story about um, Reverend Bowen is fascinating to me because he, ironically, happened to have come from Georgia. He and his wife had a baby while they were, in, they were only there for one, one term, one, one um, assign, ass, assignment. They had a baby girl, and they named that child Yoruba. Now, I don't know if you appreciate the significance of that. I am Yoruba. I belong to the Yoruba ethnic group in Nigeria. And they named their child Yoruba, showing the kind of warmth an affection that they have or that they shared with one another. But sadly, that child died under the very trying condition of uh, life in, in, in that part of the world. Let me fast forward to our own time. I'm not really interested in looking back as much as dealing with the here and now. The event at Vineville Baptist Church was what I con contributed to my making the statement that it was a faith-shattering experience. John was being very uh, charitable in, in, in alluding to that experience. They took the vote three times as to whether I should be accepted as a member, three times. And when the uh, people opposed, the, uh, opposed to my membership finally gave in, every Sunday thereafter that I would go to Vineville Baptist Church, I could almost feel the, the tension so palpable you could almost slice it with a knife. And obviously, that was not conducive to kind of any kind of uh, worshipful um, frame of mind <laughs> for me. So it wasn't long after that when I left. One of the few people at Vineville Baptist Church that extended 
uh, Christian charity um, hospitality to me was a man by the name of Thomas Holmes. It was, I think it was after that first Sunday at Bible Baptist Church, he invited Don Baxter, I think, and another student, uh, Otis, yeah, he was a, became a minister, he may still be in, in Macon, by the way. He, he invited us to, he and his wife invited us to his home, and I had my first dinner in an American home, in Thomas Holmes' home. <laughs> yes. And I'm delighted to report that Grace Home, uh, sadly enough, um, Tom died many, many years ago. But Grace Holmes is still alive. Uh, I think she's now 94, 95. And uh, we celebrated her birth, I think it was 92nd birthday about three or four years ago in Atlanta. Now, you may also know, those of you who followed this, that it was the self-same Tom Holmes that became the minister of Tatnall Square Baptist Church. And I was, when he became a minister in 1966, I think it was, I was in Berkeley, California. I had a fellowship um, to study just for the summer at the University of California in Berkeley. And one day, uh, I was getting ready to, it was getting towards the end of the summer, and uh, people were pulling me hither and there, you sh I should stay in Berkeley, you know, it would be better. And I, and I was really beginning to lean in towards that. I kept saying, well, you know, how am I going to pay for my school? Oh, go to the admissions office, they'll find money for you, and so on. <laughs> and and in, those, in those days, generosity was so, so uh, widespread, I mean, for foreign students. So one day I'm walking back to the International House, which is kind of a, like a mini United Nations. And yeah, really it was. It was an amazing experience that summer. And there was a newspaper vending machine in front of I House, International House, uh, the Berkeley Gazette, that is the, the newspaper in Berkeley. And there was a column, right-hand column, by um, Ralph McGill. <coughs> and the headline was, Minister About to be Fired. That got my attention, because you know I've known of Ralph McGill and I respected him. So I began reading it in the uh, vending machine, and it said, Tatnall Square Baptist Church about to fire its minister for inviting some black students on Mercer campus that were, had participated in the Upward Bound program. I was livid. Because as John said, the, the second day after my arrival at Mercer, the minister had actually come to me in my, don't bother coming, you and the Don Banks, don't bother coming to Tatnall Square Baptist Church because you will not be welcome. And uh, we sort of thanked him. And, and, and yeah, yeah, I mean, that's graciousness, isn't it? I mean, I mean that, that's being Christ-like, right? We thanked him and uh, he left, because we had made up a mind that Vineville was, was where we were going to be going. So I had stayed away from a church that should have been the, the most logical church for me to be. I didn't have a car, you know, didn't have a bicycle or anything. You know, just walk down from Sherwood Hall. Is it still called Sherwood Hall, by the way? Thank God for that. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, the, most, the most logical uh, church for me to, to have been worshiping. So, Minister said, you won't be welcome. And I, I thanked him, and uh, he, he left. So it was this same church that Tom Holmes was now, that minister that had come to me to tell me that I would, had retired, apparently. Tom Holmes was now the minister. So when I'm reading the story about him about to be fired, it wasn't just he alone that was to be fired. It was he, uh, his minister of music, and all the, his entire staff. I was beside myself. So I, I called all my friends who had been pleading with me to stay in Berkeley, and I said, look, I've got to go back to Macon. I have another message to deliver. And uh, so I came back. And the very first Sunday I came back, mentioned it to a few friends, 
uh, you know, about what I was planning to do, and many, a, number, a number of them volunteered to come with me, and I said, no, 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 don't do that. <laughs> we will be playing into their hands because there will then be a matter of ceremony with a bunch of agitators. Remember those terms in the, in the days? <laughs> agitators, uh, communists, troublemakers. Let me oh, go. So, so I said, I'll do it alone. And so su Sunday, I um, put on my coat and tie, and I proceeded to Tacto Square Baptist Church, walked up the steps. The ushers, who were just who were there usually to warmly wel welcome you, they froze in shock <laughs> at the sight of me. And um, I greeted them and wanted to engage them in, in conversation. And they kept saying, one of them kept saying, why don't you go worship with your own kind? And I kept trying to explain to him that I had come to try to remind them about the action that the church was about to take regarding uh, Reverend Holmes. But he was impervious. After about half an hour or so of trying and failing, all of a sudden, I, there was a tap on my shoulder. I turned around, and there was a policeman. And the policeman said to me, uh, come with me. So we walked down the steps together. And he led me to the uh, patrol car. He opened the back door, and he said, get in, get in. So I stepped in, and he shut the door. And I waited, and I waited. Finally, after about 20 minutes, uh, half an hour, thereabouts, he came back, opened the door, and said I could come out. So I stepped out. And he said, uh, we're not going to press any, uh, we won't, I'm not going to arrest you, because nobody from the church will step forward to press charges. <laughs> then he said, well, you know, uh, if you want my advice, I wouldn't try this again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because if you did, uh, I will uh, have to arrest you. And I said, officer, that's one promise I cannot make you. And so we parted. And the following Sunday was the Sunday they were actually formally going to take the vote to, it was a foregone conclusion. I mean, the, um, Dr. Tom Holmes was going to be fired. And um, again, I stepped out. By that time, what had got out in the press that um, the ceremony had tried to attend uh, Tacto Square Church and what the re <coughs> so the, the street was lined with uh, press people, um, with uh, um, electronic and and um, print. Walked up the steps. This time, the door was firmly locked. <laughs> you know, they weren't going to take any chances, right? And again, I tried to engage them in the dialogue, and it was a conversation with the deaf. I uh, wasn't making any headway. Finally, I turned around um, to, meantime, across the street, because the president's uh, residence, is it still the president's residence? Yeah. <laughs> the president, Rufus Harris, and a number of faculty members were all waiting there to sort of watch what was likely to unfold. I stepped down, and the press people cornered me, and in what essentially amounted to a press conference, asked me if I was going to try it again. And I answered a few other questions, and I said, I had already made my point, and there was no way I was going to go back. And of course, uh, Tom Holmes was dismissed. It's a dangerous game we're playing, not the dangerous one in the sense that, um, actually it is dangerous in the sense that it damages us spiritually. It damages us spiritually. In those early days of my Christian faith, uh, my favorite pop, uh, passage out of the Bible was the one that Jesus himself quoted. You know, one time he stepped into the synagogue and somebody handed him was the equivalent of the Bible, and, and it was uh, a, 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 a statement by a uh, prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to do what? Preach. 
this is really what our faith is about. As I watch the goings on among our Christian brothers and sisters, there is a minister in Dallas, um, Robert Jeffries, Jeffries, something like that, uh, who's really um, had it out for, uh, you just cannot abide uh, President Obama. And um, he's been called, not just by Jeffries, but others uh, in the so-called Christian right, of whom somebody has said they are neither. <laughs> because Christ didn't call, I mean, you know, a specific statement that Christ made, Christ made, as far as I'm concerned, on the question of jud judgment, he said, judge not, so, so that what? Because Christ, the good Lord that made you and me, knows that we're all works in progress. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye? And somehow ignore the moat, the, 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 the log that is in your own eye. There is an African statement that actually comes close to that too. He says, he who points an accusing finger at somebody is doing what? Three at himself. And I think that's about sums it up because usually people who are busy accusing other people have maybe twice as much things to be accused of. Three times as much of things to be accused of in their own closet. That is not, but Jesus was specific be on the matter of judgment, and it was also specific on what, what else? On the matter of love. Um, my Christian brothers on the right are all, I mean, they, they, they're going crazy over the matter of homosexuality. It is none of your business. It is none of my business. Let the good Lord who can see, read my heart, and read Mary's heart, be the one to judge. On the matter of um, abortion, that's another thing. And they really cannot, I mean, um, what was it that um, one of the crazies on the right uh, said in, in Texas today, the, the uh, musician, the rock, uh, position. Uh, something like Obama is something mongrel. Uh, a, few, a few days ago at a, a town hall uh, meeting, a woman, they didn't quite manage to show her face. Obama must be executed, she said. All right? And so it goes. But Christian brothers, followers of Christ, so-called, have kept mute. It is not surprising, and those of you who are old enough uh, to, to remember, when I came, when I first came here 50 years ago, the Ku Klux Klan was waxing strong, ever strong. They used as the object of terror, what? The cross of Jesus Christ. Think about it. The cry, you, talk, you, you, you think of abomination. I mean, can you get, do any worse than that? The cross of Jesus Christ was what the Ku Klux Klan used. And these self same Christians who are now up in arms against uh, Barack Hussein Obama kept their mouth shut. Anybody heard about uh, em Emmett Till? Yeah. yeah? There's three civil rights workers, Cheney, Shuana, Goodman. Anybody heard about um, Medgar Evers? Where were all these people? Why couldn't they inspired, moved by the same spirit of Christ to say, these are God's children. We will be, we'll, we, we, we will be 
found guilty by God if we were to stand aside without taking, you know, taking sides with them. They kept their mouth shut. So let me just sum up, uh, conclude by saying that you notice that uh, the title for the, for the comments that I, I made tonight was called what? Um, bearing witness. And I said to John, that's not a misspelling. It's not B-E-A-R. It's B-A-R-I-N-G. That's, that's what I saw mission, my mission to be, to lay bare again things that it's hidden in plain sight. Things that we, as a matter of course, when a man is in crisis, what? He's a new creature. Behold, what? All things. And in Christ, there is not what? East or West. And on and on. And better preachers, better students of this uh, 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 good book can probably cite you more more um, um, chapters and verse. That is why the beloved community movement, I want to call it that, is one that we should have twice as many people in this hall than we do tonight. The other thing too, and this may shock you, Christ didn't create a church. I suppose he knew why. <laughs> <laughs> that it will, it will have resulted in the kind of confusion. And the, so I'm saying, as part of the work we're doing in the beloved community um, organization is prayer that the walls of Jericho, the walls that divide the Methodists. How many brands of Methodists are there? I was saying to David uh, the other day, I said there must be about half a dozen Baptist uh, brands. And David said, no, 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 no. David, how many did you say? Well, more than 50. Okay. And you can imagine what damage that has done to the faith. If I were a non-believer and I came and I said, uh, um, Marilyn, um, I, I see you're a Christian. I'm not, but um, I would like to become a Christian too. Yeah, wonderful. But then, which one do I pick? And if you're, we're all following the same Christ, how come we cannot agree among ourselves? One faith, one, one, and so on and so forth. So let me end here, and um, so much to do. But in faith and through his grace, we shall indeed bring about, perhaps later than sooner, and it could all also be sooner than later, bring about the beloved community. Thank you again so very, very much. And may the good Lord bless each and every one of you. Sneaking out, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, talk to you later. Thank you so much for coming. No questions? That means I was brilliant. <laughs> I covered I all. I covered all the bases, right? Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> that means I covered all the bases. Yes. Yes. Do I think? Do you see? Or do I see? Re repeat your question if you don't mind. Is the, the soul of the community that is uh, keeping the spirit of the community from coming? Yes, it is indeed. Uh, it, it's, um, you know, when a man is in Christ, when a woman is in Christ, new creature. But, but the thing is, we have become so beholden to the culture. Yes. We become, and uh, that is why um, <laughs> that, that is why Tadno Square Baptist Church, for example, uh, felt that they were doing the right thing to dismiss a minister that was indeed doing God's will. Because the impact of the community on the church has become so compelling, so, so total, that the, the essence of the faith itself has almost become subsumed. And do we transcend that? We can with the, with, with the help of the good almighty God. Uh, if, we, if we're sincere, in, in really wanting to, to bring that about, and we approach God for his grace and his guidance and his help, then indeed we'll find the spirit that will enable us to, to achieve that, that dream. Mm -hmm. I remember too that in the good book, it says where there is no vision, the people perish. Here is a vision that I believe the good Lord has anointed my brother with. And those of you who have uh, seen that as a vision that has come of the Lord, she'll, she'll join him and, and, and co become co-creators with God and uh, bring about the, 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 the uh, beloved community that Dr. Martin was a king and Jesus Christ, uh, in fact, would like to see happen. Um, it certainly doesn't surprise me with the experiences that you had that your faith was broken and shaken. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, was there a particular experience or event that happened in your life that kind of helped renew your faith? Like what, what made you have the faith that you have today after going through all that and having your faith shaken? The answer to that is really simple. If you if you are sincere in being a follower of the Christ, then you realize that any manifestations people may talk about you and say do things to you. Uh, tomorrow's uh, um, offering to. I don't want to jump the gun. That might be a bit controversial, uh, but. If you truly believe that you're a child of God, then stick, sticks and stones may do what? You have to. And then um, people call names and they use labels. And I smile and I say, excuse me, that's not me you're talking about. Uh, one thing that I learned from our Indian, East Indian brothers and sisters is a greeting, which uh, uh, you probably won't see it much in, 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 in making or in even, but when Indians meet one another, they hold their hands together in front of their heart. And they take a slight bow and uh, they can either utter the word namaste or the very act itself, it's, Namaste. What does that mean? 
it says, I acknowledge in you the divine spirit that dwells in you. When God created Adam, it, it was lifeless, huh? Yes, until God did what? That essence we call life, without which you cannot live. You can't live, I can't live. That spark that was part and parcel of God, God imparted it to, into Adam, and Adam became what? And a corollary to that is a line out of the good book that says, your body is what? The temple of God. If we as Christians begin to believe that, then it isn't likely that anybody <coughs> would come and try to undermine our faith. I mean, I, I, I walk with such a plum, such confidence. Yeah. Not because I'm rich or br brilliant or but I know that I am of God. Yes. <laughs> uh, a lot of us having familiarity with Mercer and having discussed life now versus the book that we read, what would Sam Oney in 2014 say walking down from Sherwood to Patmon Square Baptist Church if he bumped into the Sam Oney 50 years ago, you had just a moment to reassure yourself or to say something to who you were then. What might that be today now that you have this perspective? I will laugh, a belly laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and laughter is good medicine. And when you are, I mean, that's why I walk through this little campus and I feel like I'm walking on air. And some of you may remember some of the remarks I made, uh, was it the Founders Day, right? A couple of years ago. That we have indeed achieved something beautiful. But it, the work isn't done. The work isn't done. It's an ongoing thing. Until you look at a person and you say, this is a representative of whom? Of God, it, that's no sacrilege. It is no sacrilege that each one of us represent. You remember that breath, that spark. You know, you could live without food for how many days? Several days. You could live with, live without water for several days. Try holding your breath. That spark of life for five minutes. <laughs> It, it is the essence that God imparted. So I'm not only a child of God, I am of God. Yeah. There is nothing can separate us from what? Love, love of God. That is, not, that is not just an idle statement. If you believe that, then you walk like royalty. It's a simple one, but also a tough one. All habits die hard. Churches have been making efforts across the racial divide, so-called. Um, exchange of ministers, hmm, that happens. Who am I to judge? I, can you imagine what a church service will be if the, the, uh, the, the, the excitement of a, 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 a black, uh, church were to be blended with the that you know the, 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 the worship mode in a white church it would be beautiful but what has happened now is there has been a well, a separation it's not quite a divorce and when there's a separation in a marriage and somehow 
people want to get together, there are all kinds of misgivings. Is this going to work? Is it not going to work? Prayers and sincerity and commitment and the acceptance of the fundamental fact of our lives as the follower of Jesus Christ, we are of God and we belong to God. And therefore, we come together, we celebrate together, we sing together as members of the same family.